Good morning from Singapore. Hello to all our friends tuning in from all around the world. Thank you and welcome to today's session for the third installment of our Plan AI series on building sustainable cities with technology and design. My name is Wei Min from SG Innovate. We are a government-backed deep tech investor and company builder whose mission is to help entrepreneurial scientists build deep tech startups that are looking to solve big global problems. Our world also, our work also involves building a global community of leaders, thinkers, and doers to drive and scale deep tech innovations in areas such as AI, healthcare, quantum tech, and autonomous technology across various industries. We are happy to present today's webinar with the Urban, Rede Urban Redevelopment Authority of Singapore, or URA for short for this Plan AI series, where we explore how innovation and artificial intelligence can possibly be applied to urban planning and cities design in order to make cities smarter, safer and more sustainable for people to live in. In our previous installments, we spoke about how AI can possibly contribute to the decision-making process for urban planning as well as how data can be better managed with Plantech. Today, we are also glad to have partner with Sidewalk Labs where they will share more on technology tools like Delft, which will help enable urban development teams to be empowered with designing cities faster and less risk. We encourage for attendees to share with us your thoughts on the topic or interact with our speakers by posting your questions in the Q&A tab located at the bottom panel of your screen. Otherwise, feel free to just say hi and do a quick shout out from where you are from in the chat box below. With no further ado, do allow me to pass the time to Brian Ho, Senior Design Lead at Sidewalk Labs for a demo of Delft. And then we will have a fireside chat that will be moderated by Eugene Lau, Deputy Director urban design technology at the URA. So yep, I shall pass the stage to Brian. Brian, please. Thank you so much, uh, women. And, and thank you very much to SG Innovate and um, the URA for having us. We're really excited to be um, presenting Delve, uh, our generative design product for master planning and urban development um, to a, a really wonderful group of um, mission aligned uh, experts and, and designers and planners. Give me one second to share my screen. Is that working for everyone? Excellent. So I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I'm Brian. I am a design lead on the Delve team. I'm joined by my colleague and senior product manager, Violet Whitney, and um, our director of business development, Amrit Deer. And today we're really excited to be talking about Delve, particularly around the topic of building sustainable cities with technology and design, because that is exactly what um, Delve and Sidewalk Labs um, want and do do with our products and, and other, other offerings. As a bit of background on Sidewalk Labs, um, it is a company seeking to combine both forward-thinking urban design and cutting-edge technology to radically improve urban life. And so I think these three elements, um, the city, the technology, and a goal on improving the human experience are really critical um, as a narrative thread for everything we do and really drive both our products um, and, and what we do with them. As a little bit about Sidewalk Labs, we are one of um, uh, several companies under Alphabet. We are a sister company to Google. Um, like other Alphabet's um, companies that you may have heard of, like Waymo or Verily or DeepMind, each of these is focused on a specific vertical. And for Sidewalk Labs, that vertical is the city. And we are looking to um, develop products uh, for cities that solve for um, a, a range of problems, and, and many of which I, I know are familiar to this audience, um, through uh, technology to improve the human experience. And so Delve, I think, is a great example of one of these products. Delve, of course, is an urban design uh, software tool. But more importantly, it empowers urban development teams around the world to deliver sustainable, affordable, and livable cities through cloud computation and machine learning. So what does that mean in practice? Well, we actually have um, a lovely video here that I will play and, and, and narrate as, as we look over. Um, but at its core, the idea behind Delve is that if we are able to provide simulations um, and machine learning to predict and analyze what designs will do, we're able to provide an evidence basis for better outcomes through the development of of new urban places. And so Delve as a tool is actually quite simple to use um, ultimately. Um, within the tool, you're configuring a number of priorities. And these priorities, of course, are things such as um, performance, cost, infrastructure. You're also configuring things like overall program targets and yield. So the fundamentals that you would need to construct a project. And of course, we're able to connect to any number of existing um, tools out there, whether it's CAD or, or spreadsheets. 
From there, the tool really gets to work to generate hundreds and hundreds of options. And each of these options is being evaluated for the same metrics that you saw earlier. And so what you're getting all of a sudden is this ability to think across designs, rethink program, and even explore different scales or intensifications of a project site. And all of a sudden, the kinds of changes that would otherwise take um, months, if not years, to, to carry through are suddenly at your fingertips in Delve. And, and through this way, we believe there's a better way to uh, build consensus, make decisions, and, and achieve better outcomes um, in urban development and urban design. Um, so I think that's a nice introduction um, to the tool. Um, one thing I'll say is that while there are other tools out there they may, may that might let you optimize for um, project finance or um, yield and, and overall density, there isn't a product out there that lets you think holistically. And we know that's what's most important to people who care about cities. It's not just that you want to optimize for one thing. You want to optimize for multiple things at a time. And Delve can do that. And we've actually seen that result in actual work with actual developers and city partners around the world. So with that introduction, I'd love to actually jump into a demo and show this group um, what Delve is and, and how it looks and behaves. So just give me one sec to, to share my screen. Great, and we're all seeing the product now? Excellent. Um, and so this is the Delve software tool. Um, it is a generative design tool. And as part of any use of Delve, a number of requirements and, and project specifics are encoded in the Delve model. So what you're seeing here is an example project. And each one of these cards is a study um, from within that project. And a study can be uh, any sort of development question you might want to explore or, or um, deliberate. That can be done through the use of the tool as a focused uh, set of design options. If I click into this study, I can see right, at, right, right away um, which of these variants are top performers. So I'm able to see um, quickly at a glance, what are the best design options for the site that meet my priority outcomes, as well as achieve things that I need, such as um, density or walkability or access to transit. It's actually quite easy in Delve to click in and get even more detail about any given design. And what's really powerful about this tool is that the details that you're getting for this design, 281, for example, are the same details you're getting for every other design in this study of, of hundreds. And so in that way, you're not beholden to just one option, uh, which is sort of the traditional way of, of master planning. You're actually able to see many options and look across them to find the options that actually do best for multiple outcomes. And so as I'm scrolling here, you're seeing a number of the default analyses that come out of the box in Delve. So you, of course, you're able to analyze things like sun and shadow, you know, things that are really critical to understanding the quality of the public realm. But you're also able to understand financial are important to developers who are seeking to make sustainable uh, and, and cities that can continue to build and grow. And so we're able to integrate spreadsheet models for both finance as well as utility demand. So we can think not only about um, uh, you know, the views and the apartment layouts, but also the infrastructure demand they might place on um, a city's utility grid. So what might be uh, the total water demand or, or waste generated by a proposed development. Of course, all of these metrics are rolled up into a summary score. And this is really how Delve's machine learning techniques are able to optimize these designs. So if I were to step back here and look across at uh, several hundred of these results, each and every one of these design options is being scored on the same metrics, which again, reflects that holistic desire for both um, good outcomes and good quality of place. And each of these uh, variants is being scored in such a way that the tool is able to learn from them and optimize over time to produce the best results. Another thing to note about Delve is that it's not just an automatic tool. We understand that um, humans have an important role to play in the urban development and design process. And many features in this tool were actually built with exactly that use case in mind. So one great example is commenting. Um, we know that urban development is a process filled with conversations and dialogue, and it's um, very much a process about developing consensus among multiple stakeholders. And you can use the commenting feature in Delve to have a conversation around specific elements of any design in a study. So you might be talking about sun hours, you might be curious about uh, the views from a specific building, you might want to know more about the unit layout and think how um, an actual building manifests as a series of apartments or, or residences. And finally, you can think about how a project inter interacts with the city around it. So it's the walkability score of any building in a development um, so that you can see and understand um, how changes that you might make to the built environment might improve walkability, not only for projects, uh, for areas within the project, but also for buildings around it. So I think just to wrap up here, um, 
one thing I'll note is that we're showing a, a synthetic site. And so this is a demo of, of a smaller um, project within Delve. We're able to work on larger scales as well. And so one example here is uh, sort of a larger 40 acre waterfront site and Delve is equally able to handle um, these larger uh, unusual conditions uh, as needed. And Delve can of course work from both an open-ended understanding of what to develop as well as specific ideas around land use or, or a Part T diagram. And so again, this is reflecting the way in which we know that planners, developers, and designers want to work. Um, they can work with the machine and, and the technology here to provide initial ideas about land use, about zoning, about building massing, and the tool will negotiate the complexity and find ways to produce um, the best results for a given set of starting conditions and even compare across a set of scenarios. So if you're wondering what might happen um, uh, if, if you have no height restrictions or if you're seeking to um, develop greater density, Delve, the tool is able to answer that question um, and again, compare its result across a number of metrics um, such as sun and shadow hours. Maybe to uh, conclude this demo, I would like to actually show a bit of work that um, uh, Delve actually did earlier this year. And so um, a customer in, in London, a developer named Quinton actually used Delve um, to develop design options that did better, not only on density, but also, the, also on quality of life and profitability. And so this is the site. It was an 85 acre master plan in sort of a dense urban area. And within that site, there was a um, remaining 12 acre parcel that um, was looking for its program. And so the developer here had an initial idea from an architect that had um, roughly 1600 uh, residential units, um, but they needed to achieve more density in order for the project to work. And so um, by using Delve, they were able to generate hundreds of options. Each of these options were being evaluated for not only unit yield, so the layout of the units themselves, um, but also the orientation and quality. And so um, the tool was able to assess to what degree might units have sufficient access to daylight, but also sufficient access to views. And of course, the tool is also able to consider important urban considerations. So what what would new density on the site do for adjacent development? Would it actually impact the sky access? And so this important question was actually addressed in the tool through one of our features where every single one of these designs was graded for how much it might actually improve or, or make a difference on the existing daylight for buildings around the site. And in this way, I think it's a really nice illustration of how Delve not only optimizes a project, it also optimizes the city in a way that improves both the placemaking and quality of life as well as the performance and sustainability of the city as a whole. And I think that's a really nice example of what Delve can do. It's looking across these outcomes, it's solving for multiple objectives and finding ways to address the needs of the many stakeholders um, that exist in a city context um, through the use of technology um, and good urban planning and urban design. I'm happy to stop here. Um, I know we have a bit of time. I'd love to hand it back to Eugene um, for the next step and I'm happy to take any questions offline as well. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Well, thanks for the uh, truly amazing demonstration. I've been, uh, like I said, uh, before the start of the session, I was telling Brian, I was really looking forward to the, the demo itself because I mean, the, the video on YouTube seems simply amazing. And to see it in action itself is, is truly, uh, I would say it's life-changing. It might even cost me my job eventually in five years time. But uh, I guess this, uh, this is the way that things are moving. You know, technology is a part of our life and we have to integrate it in the planning of uh, cities. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I'm sure a lot of you have questions for, for Brian. Um, there would be a Q&A session at the end of this, uh, this whole um, uh, webinar. So you could uh, please feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A panel. Yep. If not, uh, we could then wait for the Q&A session at the very end and we could uh, post the questions to Brian live as well. Okay, so without further ado, I'll move on to the next segment of the, this morning's webinar. So I would like to first introduce uh, the panelists that I have with me for this fireside chat. Uh, brings me great honor to be on uh, this panel together with uh, three very uh, uh, important members here who are very well versed in the aspects of technology in AI, ML, and in the planning of cities. So first and foremost, uh, we have Violet with us. So Violet Whitney is the uh, Senior Product Manager of Sidewalk Labs, and she's also the Adjunct Assistant Professor of uh, Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture and Preservation. Uh, next, we have uh, Jakob Wachowski, Director of uh, Success Advisory uh, of the APEC region and at Bentley Systems. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, Poon King Wang, Director of the Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Cities at SUTD, the Singapore University of Technology and Design. 
So I would like to introduce each of the members to give a brief uh, introduction uh, of themselves before we go on to the fireside chat. So maybe you start with Violet yourself. Sure, thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, so uh, I am currently a product manager, but my background actually comes from architecture and architecture technology. So I um, have been advising on a new program, uh, master's program at Columbia focused on computation in the built environment. And so um, we think a lot about how to bring computation in, into the field of um, both architecture, but real estate development and the planning and design of cities. Great, thanks Violet, short and sweet. Next we'll move on to Jakob. Here we go. I was trying to find the button. Uh, welcome, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Jacob. Good morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure um, uh, participating in this, uh, in this event. Um, so I'm a director for the Success Advisor in APEC at Bentley's. Uh, we, we, our group advises uh, EPCs, owners, governments, organizations as well around the world around how to best leverage technology and what type of technology is the best for to achieve certain outcomes, whether these are um, societal efficiency, safety outcomes. Uh, but actually my background is um, I'm an architect, I'm an engineer as well. Uh, I've actually done a few urban planning projects um, as well, um, airports. But for me, re the real emphasis is how technology impacts society, impacts infrastructure, uh, ultimately how does it impact the businesses that operate in AC uh, industry overall. Thank you, Jakob. Yeah, you're the best of both worlds, an architect and an engineer. Uh, I'm sure you bring uh, much value insights into our chat later. So uh, last but not least, we have King Wan. Thank you, Eugene, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I know we have uh, folks all the way from Canada and Mexico as well, so thank you for joining. And thank you for having me here. I and the director of a research center, we pay a lot of attention to what all this all means for the person who's just trying to get by every day, uh, struggling with the challenges in life, but also pursuing and striving for the aspirations. So pay a lot of attention to that. Thank you, King Wan. All right. Sure. Okay, so let's start off the fireside chat. Maybe I'll get the ball rolling by uh, giving a question to the, the panelists over here um, on the topic of sustainable cities uh, I, I guess we can all agree that um, in modern times like this and in the world that we live in today sustainability itself is no longer a special requirement for a city I mean it is a prerequisite for all modern cities to be planned as one that's uh, sustainable so uh, in your own opinion uh, maybe you can share what are your thoughts of uh, what is a sustainable city and what, do a what does a sustainable city mean for the world that we live in today? Violet, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I think sustainability today is probably really about balance. So understanding the whole life cycle of the city and understanding the externalities of decisions that are made. So um, how one decision impacts another um, portion of a system or a portion of the city. So how can we recognize, you know, we, we know we're all more interconnected. Um, so really understanding um, the balance between an entire system. Good points, Violet. Yeah, truly, the uh, sustainable city is a very complex system that we have to learn to strike a balance. Yeah, it doesn't matter whether you're a mayor or just a gardener. Yeah, we all have to play a part. Uh, Jakob, how about your thoughts? For me, uh, generally, uh, sustainable cities really about the impact on the citizens, right? Because cities are made for the citizens. Uh, so it's what type of impact is it on health, on the liv livability, whether the city is reactive or uh, responsive to the needs of, a, of, of the people that live in those cities. But at the same time, I think it's about impact on the creators of those cities. So urban planners, architects, engineers, are they able to understand the city? Can they query the city and different assets? Can they control it and plan it? I think uh, that's for me a sustainable city, which is responsive to the needs of the end consumers of the city, but also um, provides um, the, 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 the ability to, to better um, predict the future for whoever designs the cities overall. Thank and you, I can Jacob. Yeah. Into details later. <laughs> 
Yeah, you can go on more later. Yeah, but you raise a very good point. So the the planners and the urban designers play a very important part in the design of a sustainable city, and because we are the ones who actually write the policies who impact it downstream. That's a very good point, Mace. And uh, last but not least, King Wan. So sustainably for me, let me borrow something that uh, Richard Rogers once mentioned. I don't know whether it was a book exhibition or talk. Uh, I haven't checked. I know I saw it somewhere and he raised the example of what the Athenians used to say in ancient Greece, that they used to take an oath uh, that go, went along these lines that I shall leave this city more beautiful than when I first found it. And if people are prepared to invest in today, tomorrow and next generation and are motivated to do it not because it's just family or friends, but because it's a shared vision and a shared commitment to the future, then I think we will be able to achieve sustainability, whether it's environmental, social, financial or economic. Thank you, King One. Very meaningful quote. Yeah, because at the end of the day, we are designing for our our loved ones, our kids, and their kids for the next hundred years to go. All right. So um, let's kickstart the fireside chat. I would love to uh, start it with Violet. I have some questions for you that I hope that you can address and uh, share with the members of um, the, the, that we have here today. The attendees. We have about uh, almost a hundred people. Yeah, it's a good crowd. And I see a lot of questions coming in fast and furious about Delve itself. I think we have to hold it to the Q&A session. But first and foremost, Violet, uh, you are the, uh, the brain behind uh, Delve. So could you share with us, uh, how would Delve uh, bring about convenience to architects and uh, designers and urban designers in the line of work? Yeah, um, I would just say, you know, you, you're seeing how many metrics um, are being calculated in the product when Brian is showcasing it. Um, if you're an urban designer or an architect or you're a cost modeler, um, you know how much grunt work that actually takes. So um, that means changing the numbers in a spreadsheet and then calling the architect and saying like, hey, did that change? Um, and these are like weeks or months of rollover time coordinating back and forth. Um, so it's really, it's really painful <laughs> um, to say the least. Uh, so we think that there's a huge opportunity um, to look at that problem a lot more holistically and for architects to not think about the design um, in terms of its aesthetics, but think about the design in terms of the actual outcomes. So, you know, de developers, architects and cities are designing um, more and more based on performance, based on greater quality of life or better daylight or higher cost ratios or uh, value to cost ratios, where typically if you see design um, today, it's usually led by really subjective aspects. So an architect chooses a design because they liked it or it looked good. Um, the designer's deliverable today can sometimes be a rendering and it's hard to know whether that design, the rendering is actually good, is that walkable? So now you're seeing developers really look at how well design holistically performs against targets they set out and thinking about the whole picture and the externalities of design decisions that they made. You know, if I increase yield, how does that impact views or light? Um, which is also super great because it means um, designs can actually be held accountable. It's not just this um, kind of uh, aesthetic interest. Um, and it also means that we're able to um, more objectively know whether something is doing well. So a computer can do it. They can minimize all that human grunt work I was talking about, which means instead of looking at one design where usually a person is like, you know, changing that spreadsheet or finagling this, they're looking at one design and they're looking at another design. Now we can populate many designs automatically and look at the problem more statistically and just surface the ones that are performing well across the board and not, you know, and discover possibilities that for designs or better quality of life that we wouldn't have even found before. So I think that's the major, the, the major change. 
Thanks, Violet. Yeah, you got it. You got it spot on about the the part on the the numerous iterations and architects and designers have to do subjective, you know, to the requirements of the clients and many other stakeholders, the members of the public. So I, I do see Delve is is really fantastic too. That I can't wait to get my hands on to try myself as an urban designer. Yeah, because the the transparency of the system and the uh, the, the model that it works on it, it brings everybody together. And uh, yeah, and they were all working on the same model. And because the, the KPIs are so transparent, it could be a very powerful tool to share uh, uh, upstream design with members of the public to get inputs for public engagement. Yeah, so truly, uh, this is going to be a game changer uh, when deployed in urban design and planning. So, and I would also like to pose another question. I mean, in amidst the the, the the times that we live in now uh, in the past year, I mean, the year is coming to an end. I can't believe it. I mean, the pandemic has been here for a whole year. Um, how would a tool like Delft be useful for a situation like this? I'm, I'm sure there are many ways that it can apply to make life better in times of the pandemic, right? Yeah, I think um, one thing that we're seeing happen a lot is just how much cities are being reshaped. So a lot of remote work means um, there's a lot of commercial office that needs to flex and malls need to change. Um, that's not easy, but um, just having the ability to uh, kind of evaluate and understand how different programs or different spaces can flex um, can help us know what to reprogram things as and make that process much easier. Um, and I think the other side of it is also being able to um, understand the flows within a city over time and how that relates to a development. So um, we typically think about the morning and evening rush hour, but now we know that commute is out the, uh, out the door. So what does it mean to think about program of spaces over time as well. So, you know, we can also look at transit and the flows of um, populations over time from different types of programs within the city to um, ensure there isn't congestion or that social distancing is actually possible. Um, so I think that's another um, major portion of it. Okay, that's just, that's really interesting. Yeah, because it, it does the job for the architect and the urban designer so that they can focus on the things downstream. I mean, I, I was just thinking, I mean, how would this change our our career in five, five years time? Does this mean that uh, architects will lose their jobs? You know, I'm sure there are some architects in the, the crowd today. Yeah, but I, I guess it wouldn't because it just simply makes life better for you, for you to focus on the finer details. I mean, that's just what architects are crazy about, right? Devils in the details, yeah. So leave the, the broad uh, parameters to the computer the AI and the machine learning, and then dive into the details later on, right? So thank you for your, your inputs, Violet. Do you have anything to add? You, you're you going to say something? No, I was just going to say yes. I mean, I think yeah. uh, designers don't want to do a lot of this grunt work. So the 95% of the grunt work that they don't want to do, um, let us handle that. And they can deal with the 5% of the really meaningful creative work um, to help you know, develop what a place can be. Totally agree. Okay, um, I'm going to move on to Jakob. So Jakob himself is an, in an, he's an expert when it comes to uh, uh, innovation and technology. And what makes it more interesting is, is he works for Bentley. So Bentley itself is a big player in the industry of architecture and en engineering and construction. So Jakob, uh, could you share your thoughts and insights with us on um, the whole discussion of AI and machine learning? So how, how would this impact, you know, uh, city planning and the AEC industry? Sure. So, uh, first of all, um, I think um, that considerations about COVID are still relevant, and I think they will be, be re relevant um, going forward, because um, the whole dynamic and use of the cities is, is, is changing. Right? I think you mentioned, Violet, about the the, uh, the the flows right so I think that the, the the analysis of of and, and simulating the behaviors of a city uh, where people live where people work uh, where people commute where people have dinner I think that's something that's becoming more and more important and the availability of this data is also becoming 
um, possible now. Um, we're starting to track uh, people movements based on cell phone, da cell phone data or based on um, CCTV screenings or based on GPS data or other type of data sources. I think we can now understand how city is being utilized. And, and I think um, while we need to consider the micro scale or um, somewhere between the macro and the micro scale, I think we need to always go back to this macro scale because ultimately um, whatever happens within the plot is affected by whatever happens is, is surround, surrounding the plot. So I think um, algorithms are becoming available now to be able to understand that complexity, to be able to simulate at a city level or even at the regional level, how um, based on potentially on a number of data sources, right? So we would, so we've been working with uh, something about 2,500 uh, 2, cities to model the city behaviors where we've, we've taken uh, data sites such as locations, point of interests, um, business data, uh, pedestrian movement, but also the surveys. So, so we, because obviously all of this data is, is just trying to understand what's happening currently, but we don't have the real insights about what people do with the cities. So the government say, surveys are actually quite important. And only when we bring these data together, we can start to understand uh, what do people do when committing to work, right? Do they stop for a coffee? Do they, uh, do they uh, how long do they spend in the park? And, 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 and I think understanding these different patterns, modeling the traffic, modeling the, the, the demand for new infrastructure is becoming more and more important. Um, but I would, really tackle it at scale. So I think there are different scales to decision-making. So first of all, you have a city level planning and master planning where of course, different type of data sources need to come together. Then we have more of the entity level. So what's happening in a building or what's happening with a particular road, a particular rail infrastructure. Um, and then what's happening at the, at the asset level. So a particular pump, a particular um, um, maybe evolve in a, in, a, in, a, in a water network. So I think all of these different, um, um, let's say, scales are starting to interact and help decision-making. So I think um, that's what I see happening in, in, in this space and digital, definitely the, the application of it, the creation of the digital replicas, the digital twins of these different systems um, will become crucial uh, within the next few years. Thank you, Jakob. Very interesting points, very valid points raised because I do also uh, resonate with what you just said that the importance of uh, multiple sources of data coming together in the right format, in the same format, and uh, also ensuring that the data is clean and accurate yeah, because that's very important uh, to make sure that whatever we extrapolate from this point onwards is accurate, is, is real, yeah. And, and, and we've done, uh, we've, we look at the data on a number of projects and we see that only about 1% of data is actually uh, properly tagged, able to analyze, you know, ma ma machine learning um, technologies uh, require, uh, require um, uh, most of them require structured data, right? So we need to tag images. We need to, we need to tell an, an algorithm that this is a pump, this is a road. Uh, by default, they don't understand this. So, so uh, and if, if only 99, 1% uh, of data is, 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 is uh, let's say, good to work with, um, imagine what a 99% of data is, is, is simply uh, what we call dark data. And we need to, we need to change this uh, dynamics. Yeah, I, I do agree also as well. Yeah, baby steps, yeah, one step at a time. 1%, it's a good start, I hope, yeah. But uh, I mean, yeah, I, there are a lot of gaps and challenges that uh, we need to address in trying to embrace technology, especially AI and ML. So uh, what do you think about uh, are some of the steps that we need to take for the next, I would say, the next five years in order to make a, a vast improvement in the embracing of this uh, technology? So... so We've made the model, which is a five level model of transformation. It starts with a data collector. Uh, it, it, then, it, it then moves into data reporter and then it ends up with a digitally driven operations, digitally driven cities, digitally driven engineering firm, right? So um, I think the first, the first step is really to um, structure the data. 
label things, name things, move, you know, we, we talked about BIM. I think that's the BIM has been for, for, for 30 years now. Uh, and, but, I, 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 but if I look at the cross section of the industry um, across Asia, it, it, it didn't take off properly, right? Where people uh, tend to adopt uh, in pockets certain parametric design, generative design. But if you look at the cross sections, the vast majority of data is not intelligent. So we need to turn this around, right? So I think we need to start to really um, apply standards such as ISO 19650 for information management. We need to apply data standards and quality standards and just really just make the, the um, uh, make it accessible to others, make it visible. And then we move towards, okay, now we have the data available. Can we report on it? Can we bring it to uh, to Dell for other applications, right? Can we, can we bring it and so we can make informed decisions based on it. And now, the, and now another thing is people, right? So can, can people consume it? So, because it's not just about technology and data structures and all that, that's one dimension, but another dimension is really about, are people capable of absorbing this, of, 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 of interpreting this data and leveraging it on an ongoing basis when they do their engineering design planning operations. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacob. Uh, I'm, I'm sh this is recorded. I'm sure to share this with my colleagues who are in the policy department because they are the ones who help to influence all this decision making. Yeah. So very good points raised. Uh, last but not least, uh, I'll move on to King Wan. So um, maybe I'll, I'll start, you know, here we are talking about cities and construction and all, but at the end of the day, we are designing sustainable cities for the people, right? I mean, we we're building cities for the people. So could I get your thoughts, you know, on, on how do you feel that uh, technology will impact the lives of people downstream when we live in these uh, smart, sustainable cities? Sure. Uh, let, maybe let me pick up from what Jacob and Violet said. Uh, I, I looked at the Delft demonstration and Violet talked a lot about transparency because now you've got a lot of data coming in. And I was thinking about how usually we involve citizens in the design process. Uh, a long time ago, when there was a lot of work, people would do consultations. And that is if you are lucky, right? If the government decides, I'm going to consult you. Uh, so that was the first step. And now I think we have more participatory sort of mechanisms. So people come and maybe do something together. But I thought maybe the next stage we could be thinking, and for lack of a better word, maybe something about co-designing. Uh, you've got an increasingly educated middle class in many cities, well educated. Some of them have uh, side hustles or you know side hobbies and maybe even design uh, in different parts of the communities. And the question is whether you could actually use this to bring more people into the design uh, element of this. And what would that mean? It would be quite interesting to think about this. So go beyond consultation, go beyond participatory to actually co-designing together. Right. So would you be prepared to turn over? A small part of your city for the community to design, right? And you know what would that mean for policies? What would that mean for professional fees, maybe? <laughs> and what would that mean for a lot of other factors? So I thought the transparency point to get a Dell demonstration uh, made me think about that. Uh, the second part that Jakob mentioned about the quality of the data is quite uh, is, is 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 actually a perennial problem. We've heard that in healthcare, for example, uh, people try to digitalize or digitize healthcare records and they've given up, right? And one of the reasons is because the way doctors key in, uh, write in their medical information is very different from the way nurses do it. And the two are not compatible. And I know one uh, healthcare startup has decided to just collect data from scratch. So the problem of data quality is quite key. Uh, we face that in our work on the future or work too, where we think job descriptions and job CVs are updated, but usually they're not. And I think it's interesting to think a little bit about what that means for the way we collect data. Um, from citizens and of course from the data collection mechanism of the statistical officers or from different government agencies. What that means in terms of the type of data they collect, how they collect and whether we need to have some data quality standards so that everybody along the entire spectrum, right, from the municipal government to maybe even international bodies to the citizen, right, when they collect or they agree to give their data is done in a format that is hung together around a framework that makes it easy to be scalable and maybe that's an endeavor is going to take uh, many, many decades. Uh, well, well, that's scary, but maybe a few years. <laughs> but you know, decades is more likely. Uh, the last one is really usually the whole business of uh, democratization of data, democratization of services. If you make this available to uh, the citizens, there will be some segments who won't be able to assess it. 
And so the question of uh, stratification, device inequalities will come up. So it's important to think about not just the access uh, to the data, access to the services, but also the quality. Uh, and maybe some of our, just to raise the, since uh, Eugene asked about the pandemic earlier, uh, it's important to raise a sim that some of the existing metrics of access and quality may not suffice. So for example, before the pandemic, everybody in all international surveys, including Singapore's, we, and we looked at whether people access, we asked a question like, can you have internet access at home? And the answer is yes, of course we do, right? Not, not many people don't have it. But now when you need to do home-based learning, you need to do work from home, the question becomes, do you have enough devices at home to assess it? Can your broadband support it? And can you have five people logging at the same time for five hours? And I think we need to update our metrics uh, on, on what it means to have democratized as well as equitable uh, access and quality of use to services and data. And one thing that I, I as a comment, right, I think we're living in a privileged world in Singapore. If you look at um, other surrounding countries, cities, and you compare how people behave in a city like such as Singapore with how people behave in a small within a small village in India. I think those are completely different standards. So I think the met different metrics will apply to different cities. And uh, if you look at Singapore, COVID has indeed affected the way we use the city, but we cannot really spread. We cannot really go wide. While in other cities, you, you can see that it's going, it's, it's spreading, right? People are moving out of San Francisco. People are moving out of, of New York or, 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 um, or London and, and, and enjoying the countryside. Uh, but in Singapore, we can only go up and down, right? So I think um, we need to consider those different dimensions and, and, and different type of environment as well, because not the same, po the same policies, policies will not apply and metrics and data models Will will apply to 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 these different environments. Thank you, Jakob. Thank you, King Wan, for sharing your thoughts on this. Yeah, it's very good points raised about. Uh, but there's a certain uh, key word that uh, King Wan mentioned just now: the responsibility that I strongly resonate with, and especially when we're talking about the topic of sustainability and the pandemic over here. I'm sure a lot of us have seen this meme online, whereby the shark comes out to eat the smaller fish, which is the COVID-19, and the bigger shark that eats the fish is actually climate change. Yeah, yeah. because in, in one or two years' time, when we're done with the vaccine and, and COVID-19 is gone, climate change is here to stay for the next 50 years or 100 years. You know, this is real. There's no escaping that. <clears throat> so, I mean, in, uh, I'm just going to pose this question to all of you, the panelists out there. So in your thoughts, how, how do you think that uh, so technology can actually influence the people of sustainable cities to live in a more responsible manner and to live in a uh, a way that is more sustainably, uh, sustainably responsible. I Could can start. <laughs> yeah, sure, Violet, yeah. Mm. Um, I think like I, I'm hitting on this externalities point quite a bit, but um, I think just being able to measure the impacts is really crucial. So, um, King Wan, you're, you were talking a bit about um, co-development. Um, I think one of the important things about the transparent metrics is um, not just co-development, but being able to understand the impacts of a development, not just for the developer, but for these other things that they just haven't seen in the past. So it's not that um, during the development of cities or the development of places that a developer doesn't want to know um, how it does for walkability or um, other sustainable metrics. They want to know, um, but maybe there's no uh, inherent measurement of it. And so if you can't see it, you're not going to do anything about it. You're not going to change it. So I think um, having it as a default that you understand the um, externalities and the impacts uh, is a major factor that's going to help open our eyes because, you know, climate change is up here, but when we're down here working on our silly little city designs, you know, um, we need something to remind us of 
how our decision is making an impact. What is it doing to change that um, so that we know what we can do? Oh, that thought, Pilot. This is a very good point, Trace. I, I see a question in the, the Q&A panel. I'm just going to ease into the Q&A right now because uh, I think we're running a bit short on time. I see that Brian has very efficiently answered all the questions related to Delve. Okay, so I, I'm just going to try not to ask questions about Delve. Okay, no, not so much of the technical questions. <laughs> I have questions of my own. I'll probably email you, right? Okay. Um, but there is this question here that says uh, from um, Miriam, how do you expect old folks who are not as tech savvy to survive in a smart city and also adapt to sustainable means of life you know, when their life is spent so differently in the past 50, 60 years? And how do you make cities to uh, design cities to be more cohesive and, uh, and more inclusive as far as possible. I would like to raise a, a very quick example of Singapore, whereby in order to, to address the pandemic, we have this trace together tokens, whereby um, or to start off, we, we, the government actually designed a trace together app, whereby it works with Bluetooth. You know, you're supposed to install it on your smartphone, turn on your Bluetooth, and when you're within close proximity to someone who has COVID, who's tested positive, you will be notified and that uh, to know that you were there at the place with a COVID-19 positive person. Yeah, so, so the, the intention was uh, very well thought through, but unfortunately there are the elderly who do not even have a smartphone. So how do you address issues like this? You have to design another token for the elderly to actually go and collect it. And this token is Bluetooth uh, uh, enabled and therefore they are expected to carry it around with them wherever they go. Yeah, and then next issue would be the battery life how would the elderly know how to plug in a USB-C cable into the token, you know, to charge it uh, when it runs out of battery? So a lot of things to think through when designing for the elderly to be inclusive as a city as well. So, I mean, to, to King Wan and Jakob, any thoughts on this to share? You want to start, King Wan? Yeah, sure. So this is actually one of those things we've been thinking about a lot. And I think what Singapore did and what Eugene highlighted about having a physical token and an app, uh, different strokes for different folks. I think there must be that recognition of a certain diversity. And, and let me start off by saying that let's start with the assumption that when we do implement a technology solution, somebody has thought through to say that it's important for the population or enough segments to have it. If there is a solution that we don't think some of the population should have it, uh, there's a separate discussion, right? Because there's a whole, you know, philosophical as well as a design consideration. But let's assume that something the city wants to push out and we know it's important for everybody, it's going to back everybody. I think first different strokes for different folks. But let me add in another dimension which we've uncovered in the course of our, our research. And one of the things that's always puzzled me, right, is that you do realize that we think the folks who are digitally savvy are the young ones today. We usually think that way. And of course, those of us who are a bit middle aged would think I belong to the younger set, right? So we, we like to assume that. Uh, well, a discussion for another day again. But I like to raise this point, especially when it comes to the workplace and even in the, for the slightly older professionals. We, we forget that those who are in their 40s or 50s were the digital natives of their time, 20 years ago, right? We, they were ones who first built the first websites, figured out HTML and the first mobile apps. And the question I've always had is that, well, how do we get from one generation being digitally savvy to the ones now being, be, us feeling that they are ones that are being left behind? And I think there's something to be said about thinking about how we support people through transitions of technologies. And one of the ideas that we're playing with, we don't have any conclusive ideas yet, but maybe we need different types of tech support. So for example, in the older generation, for somebody who was in her 60s in a company, she's leading the transformation drive, but even then she feels that the technology changes are moving so far, she's a bit concerned. She used to lead the digitalization drive in some of our banks as well as in IRS and CPF. So, you know, they know what they're doing. And she said, sometimes all I need is to know that when I press a button, right, that it's not going to explode, right? That there is a way to undo, redo, and there's a way to rectify if, if I do, do the wrong thing. And I think for the older generation, for example, they sometimes don't realize that because in the past you press a button, it goes, it explodes, right? So maybe the way we provide tech support uh, instead of just getting them a hotline, maybe it could be just somebody call a hotline and say, am I pressing the right thing? Let me show you the video. Uh, just thinking about how we provide tech support to different generations and different segments of society, pretty much in the same spirit of different strokes for different folks might actually be a way for us to ensure that more of the population comes along for the digital drive more than uh, them being left behind. So something to think about. We are starting to play around with those ideas and we'll, we'll see where we get with that. For me, it's really about um, customer centricity, right? If you think about 
how people consume information. And I think it's about hiding the complexity that's behind the scene. We might have the best data engineers, you know, masterminds that will make the city digital behind the scenes, but then revealing the right information at the right time to the right people. And if you think about, let's say, what a citizen needs, doesn't necessarily need to be being presented in an app. So we can predict, for instance, the, the need for a hospital or a clinic in a certain area by analyzing how people interact in the city, what are the density areas, where people go through, what is the walk, walk, walkability uh, index. And we can then um, position those hospitals, position these um, assets near where uh, people actually need them. So is it a digital or is it analog? I mean, the interface doesn't have to be analog, um, digital, but there is a whole digital ecosystem behind the scenes that is then presented in an analog way to uh, the citizen. Uh, so I think it's about hiding this, uh, this complexity. Yeah, and maybe um, for every time we think that an older generation is not tech savvy, I ask them, look at how many of them are playing Mahjong on the mobile phone and watching K-drama on the mobile phone. And you go like, oh, maybe we just need to do a better job helping them use it easier and to have the motivation to use it. So just a, just a thought. <laughs> That's true, yeah. Talk about my mom. I have to teach her to use a Bluetooth token, but she can use her phone and watch all the K-dramas. Yeah. So, yeah, very good points, Ray. So, uh, not that much time left. I'm looking at a lot of questions over here. Um, maybe from the topic of customer centricity, that's a very interesting word, another very useful keyword over here. Because this leads me to my next question, which I, which I see here from um, uh, Coco. So, for smart cities, I... I I think that autonomous and self-driving vehicles should be incorporated within the, the infrastructure. I mean, that we've been doing that all over the world. We're trying to do that all over the world. But the challenge is uh, the integrating with existing infrastructure. So how, how do you think that this could be done uh, effectively so that we do, do not disrupt um, the livelihood of the people living in the city? Because at the end of the day, it's all about customer centricity. Yeah, what we are implementing here might be useful or might be... Um, uh, relevant for some people, but not so relevant for the others, and it's going to be disrupting their life at their inconvenience. Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, checks and balances that we have to do. And maybe I'll just throw in another question over here to end it off because I think we're running out of time. Last but not least, to end it off with the topic of AI, as we're talking about autonomous vehicles, self-driving vehicles. When it comes to AI, what kind of regulations do you think that needs to be set in place? Because as far as a lot of people are concerned, AI is only in movies, you know, it's, it's not real yet. Yeah. But here we are, we're telling people it's real, it's coming for you and you better embrace it. So how do we prepare people for this? I think just being able to understand AI is really important. So I guess this comes back to some of the points about customer centricity. Um, which was really about, um, can I understand this complex technology um, to do what I want or do the thing that I need? Um, and I think some of the issues arise around AI when we don't know what it's doing, so we can't trust it. So um, I think the auditability of AI in, a, in very... Um, uh, simple enough terms that um, we can know how it's behaving. And then there are many other things that come from that, but the first step is just um, being able to understand what it is. For me, it's about um, being able to simulate uh, the city before the fleet is actually um, walking around or driving around um, the city. Uh, and this is where I think technologies such as photogrammetry, uh, where you can start to um, scan the city on even on, you know, on a daily basis almost uh, through vehicles, try to recognize art, um, assets. Um, and then you can start to train because ultimately AI is, in a, is, 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 is driving the cars first and foremost within the, within the virtual environment. And then it replicates this in a digital environment. So if we can, we are able to, um, to, you know, Google has started in many ways. Now we have 
many other technologies um, to, to capture the CT. Um, Tesla is doing it also on a daily basis. They have actually a competitive advantage because they have a fleet of cars w running around and, and scanning the city. So if we are able to uh, have a, a complex and comprehensive model of a city, uh, we can simulate uh, these um, self-driving behaviors without actually self-driving, right? So we can. So I think that's something that will will help. So maybe let me address both questions, and I have to apologize to Jonathan. I was just scrolling through the questions, and I. Uh, accidentally move his uh, question to the answer column. So if Jonathan, if you want to put it back to the open column, please do so. Uh, there are two questions here. One is on AI and how you apply, and two is working within existing infrastructure. Uh, in the case of AI, the, the problem starts when the algorithm decides to take your directions to it to a logical conclusion. So the example of this is that if you set an AI algorithm to say, please save the earth, right? And it sounds eminently like a good idea, but what if to save the earth, they have to kill all the human beings, right? Then they'll kill all the human beings, right? So, so the problem is when it takes, the algorithm takes the conclusion or its direction to its logical conclusion, uh, the logical extreme. And the idea behind this is, um, I mean, there are many schools of thought, but one of them is by Stuart Russell, who talks a little bit about beneficial AI. And the idea is that you need to incorporate the human interventions at the right places to make sure that this is indeed what you intended, right? Rather than just let it take this logical extreme. So just as an idea there. Uh, the second question from, uh, I think it was Coco. I, I think there is some context to the question. Uh, so I don't know if my answer is going to address that context that um, um, Coco has in mind, but let me give an example from my Zhang fellow who's doing some work in uh, China cities, in China, four Chinese cities, about 30 million, 40 million population and all. And the thing he had to do was to think about how to move to an electric vehicle infrastructure. And the way he did it was to look, to use big data to do that. What do I mean by that? Because if you actually charge electric vehicles now, to get a full load, you need to charge three, four hours. And that's going to affect, say, the taxi drivers. He used big data to show that if you actually charge only 70%, it only takes about an hour. The remaining 30 to 30% 30 requires three, four hours. And which means that you can actually do it during your lunchtime. Right? And that actually means that if you then put your charging stations close to, say, lunch places, you can actually convince cab drivers to move to, to that. And then you can charge less. You, you can then charge, everybody can charge during the lunch hours. And then the adoption of the electric vehicles will be much, much, much higher. So that's one way to think about this, is that by using data, you show how the new infrastructure can improve on the old infrastructure and what to keep from the old infrastructure as well. And so it brings us back to the earlier conversation about the quality of data, transparency, etc. Thank you. Thank you for all three of you for sharing your thoughts on this. Yeah, I see Wei Ming has popped up. <laughs> I guess uh, we have come to the end uh, quite nicely. The timing is just right. But uh, once again, I would love to thank all the panelists, you know, for your wonderful insights and your sharing on the, the topics of technology and sustainable cities. Very, I've learned so much just from this hour today. Yeah, and uh, not forgetting the, uh, the questions uh, from the attendees over here, I'm sorry that we can't answer all the questions. I tried to pick up some of the questions to address, but, uh, and for the technical questions that you have, uh, in particular regarding to uh, Delph, I, I think maybe SG in a bit could share the point of contact after this session for people to get in touch with Sidewalk Labs if they have any interest to collaborate. Okay, Wei Ming, uh, so without further ado, I'll hand the stage, virtual stage back to Wei Ming. Yep. Thank you, Eugene, for this uh, great discussion with the speakers. I myself was uh, impressed with the Dell demo, although I'm neither an uh, engineer or architect. Uh, I think many actually say, shared the same sentiments because there were just so many questions being posted just on uh, Delft itself. And thank you, Brian, for answering most of those. And I also share uh, the, the, the same sentiments with Eugene on um, having to learn a lot about different perspectives and consideration, considerations shared on cities planning with technology as well. So uh, that being said, I'd like to represent SG Novit to thank all the attendees who have stayed with us until now. And I would like to say a big thank you to all our speakers, uh, Jakub, Violet and King Wang for the webinar and great sharing from everyone. Uh, attendees do keep a lookout for our post-event mail, which will re uh, contain a recording of the session and do reach out to us at events at sgnovate.com if you'd like to connect with any of our speakers or to have a chat with us for collaboration opportunities. So uh, we will likely be sharing some context uh, if, if you would like to be in 
be connected to Sidewalk Labs for, for other opportunities as well. So do remember to give us your post-event feedback when you exit the webinar or through the post-event mail as well. With that, uh, this is Wei Min signing out from this webinar. Hope that everyone will have a great day ahead. Stay safe, stay healthy. Hope to have you again in our next webinar session. Goodbye. Thank you.